be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, at your divine baptism in the Jordan River, you reveal that you are consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us holy by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit and make us worthy to celebrate this festival of lights so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one Father whose voice came from heaven, testifying to his beloved Son, and to the only begotten Son, who is worshipped, whose light radiated upon the river, and who accepted the baptism from John, his forerunner. And to the one Holy Spirit, who descended and appeared above the head of the Son. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast, and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. The earth rejoices in your epiphany, O Son of God and the peoples and nations shout for joy on this day of your baptism. You have dawned from the Father and have sanctified baptism for us. O Church of the nations, proclaim the glory of the Son of God, who became man and was baptized for your sake in the Jordan River, and cry out to him, Blessed are you, O Christ, the Word of God. You willingly emptied yourself and took the form of man. You gave us a pledge of life in the waters of baptism, making us holy and heirs of your kingdom. Now, o Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us through this great epiphany. Create a new heart within us, make us newborn children of your Father, and pour out forgiveness upon your flock, that we may worship you, glorify your Father, and give thanks to your Holy Spirit forever.
O Christ, word of the heavenly Father, you became man for our sake and were baptized in the Jordan River. You became the way and the door that leads us to the Father. Grant us your grace and your mercy and accept the fragrance of our incense that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Kodishat, Hayalato no Kodishat, Lo Mahoyoto, Mshi Ho Detamed, Men Yuhano, Waters have been truly blessed. All on earth be attentive. Waters have been sanctified. St. Paul to the Galatians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, before faith came, we were held in custody under law, confined for faith that was to be revealed. Consequently, the law was our disciplinarian for Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a disciplinarian, for through faith you are all children of God in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free person, not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Adam's descendant, heirs according to the promise. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Yeah. 
the last of the trinkets in and insects to the sun. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Hussein John, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle John writes, Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And he came to Jesus at night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no man can do these signs that you are doing unless God be with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus answered, amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. So do not be amazed that I have told you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from, or where to where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things happen? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Amen. Amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But you do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, then how will you believe if I tell you about the things of heaven? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have life eternal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. This is the truth, peace be with you.
what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So culturally, we hear a lot about the immigration, the flux of people, the movements around, and it's quite traumatic at times to see the number of individuals who have died trying to make these treks. And we also talk about race all the time these days. Race, race, race. It's always about race. So it's important for us to pause at times to actually consider what does our faith actually teach and what is Christianity, how does Christianity actually see these things? So first of all, with immigration, the world has always been in flux. People have always been moving around. I've recommended to some of you, perhaps I've recommended from the pulpit, a book called Silk Roads by Peter Frankopin. He's an English professor of history or something. It's an excellent book. It's an overview, a world history, to show how East and West have always been interconnected. We have this idea that somehow before our age, nobody really traveled or did those things. Fewer people traveled, of course. It was more difficult. But East and West have always been in contact. And so it's important to understand this kind of flux and this movement. And the reason being is you'll notice on the front of the bulletin, there is a picture of a pope. That picture is of Saint Sergius I, who is feast day is today, that's why we chose. It is a picture that's taken from the mosaics that are in, hundreds of them, in the Basilica of Saint Paul outside the walls in Rome. And when you go in, there are these medallions with all of these pictures and names and the dates the time that they were popes from the Linus all the way back. And of course, the beautiful Roman tradition is there are empty circles filling up the rest of the building. And the tradition is, is when the last one's filled, it's the end of the world. Now, when I visited in the 80s, there were only four left. But when I visited back in the early 2000s, they had actually built more frames in the other parts of the walls. So I just leave you with that with the Roman tradition. So this picture that is taken is taken from um, from St. Paul outside the walls. And St. Sergius stands out, and the reason why I wanted to speak about this coincidence of his feast day on the 23rd of January with the Sunday is most people are not aware that we have had six Syrian popes of Rome. Six. Most of them being in the 7th and the 8th century, so the 600s and the 700s. St. Sergius is Pope from 687 to seven, um, 701, I believe. And the first of the Syrian Popes is Anicetus, or Aniketos, who is Pope in the second century, about the year 160. He's the first of the Syrians. In the seventh and eighth century, we also had Greeks Greek speakers who were also popes of Rome. So there's a period in the 600s and the 700s leading up to the time of Charlemagne in which you have definitely, very clearly, this whole vision of this continuity and connection between East and West. So St. Sergius is a man who's probably born about the year 640. So he is exactly contemporary with St. John Marin, our first patriarch amongst the Maronites, to understand East and West what is happening. And as another detail, St. John Maron, by tradition, historically about his life, he has grandparents who are Franks. Now, this is before the Crusades. You meet lots of Lebanese these days. They all, most of them have some kind of European blood in their background just because of the Crusaders. But that's after the year 1100. But St. John Maron, being born in the 600s, already has Frankish grandparents, people that we would call French or Germans, actually, the Franks, but Europeans. And this interconnection is that St. Sergius' family emigrated to Sicily in the early 600s, before his birth. He was born in Palermo, on, on the island of Sicily. That is not because of Islam. The attacks of Islam are beginning at that time, but it's because in the 500s already, these battles between the Persian Empire and the, and the Roman Empire, Byzantium, Constantinople, back and forth, just ransacked the Middle East during the 500s. 
It's one of the reasons why when Islam explodes out of the Arabian Peninsula, it has an easy time actually just decimating and destroying the Middle East because the Persians and the Romans had had enough. They were exhausted by fighting basically a war that had gone on for a century, on and off, back and forth, over the same area which you now know today as being Iraq. It has always been this place of conflict. And also in the middle of the sixth century, in the mid 500s, there also the plague, the bubonic plague came through and destroyed about 25 to 30% of the population in the area. So taxes were low, fields went fallow, and the taxes being low mean that you couldn't hire, you couldn't pay soldiers, the army was reduced, and so when Islam surges out from the south, and they're doing just fine during the pandemic, because they've all been isolated in the sands of Arabia, so they've not caught the bubonic plague, but all the city dwellers, which is all the Middle East, the Middle East, when you see it now, we have to understand at the time, it was extraordinarily high urban cultural civilization throughout Mesopotamia and Syria and Palestine. These are city dwellers, these are merchants. These people have a phenomenally high culture. I mean, now you look at it and it's just been destroyed by so many centuries of mayhem and war. And for those reasons, in the 500s and the early 600s, apparently Sergius's family, they packed up and the people who could flee the area fled. Immigration, right? Not just simply looking for economic benefits, but also we can't live here anymore. This has just been destructive. Tens of thousands of people dragged off into slavery by the Persian Empire, just out of Jerusalem itself alone. And remember, this is the same period of time of the taking captive of Jerusalem, the, the taking of the relics of the true cross, which will then, when they're recovered, become the foundation of our feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross in September. So by the early 600s, a lot of Syrians just left. It's all the same empire, you emigrate, you move, they move, they're Mediterraneans, they move to Sicily. And that's where Sergius is born. For of course in the 630s becomes now the surge of Islam throughout the Middle East and the crashing into all of the corners of the Persian and Byzantine Empire. This is why the Syrians left in so many great numbers to go west, to resettle. These days, they flee from Lebanon now. All the doctors and the engineers and the nurses are all fleeing from Lebanon. It's part of the whole tragedy because they can't feed their families and they can find jobs in America. So all of our parishes down in Texas and Florida, because they have money, they're not gonna to move to the Arctic winds of Maine like they had to do at the beginning of the 20th century. They move where they want, which is like Florida and Texas. So we have huge thriving parishes like in Houston, they're, they're relatively new. So they're still living their ethnic thing. So Sergius's, Sergius's family living in Sicily, Sicily itself is attacked by the Muslims in the 600s. We forget the surge of Islam was extraordinary throughout the 600s, reaching all the way out through Spain and even pushing into what is modern day France. It's such an extraordinary part of history, but in part because the empire had been profoundly weakened. In fact, the Persian empire from its internal problems also, besides plague, just collapses under it. That's why you know it as being an Islamic country, an area. So Sergius, a lot of the people left, the priests who were on the island, the clergy who were on the island of Sicily with the attacks and the onslaughts from the sea by the Muslims, they went onto the peninsula, onto the mainland, and then many of them got work in Rome. This is how the Syrian priest Sergius winds up being in Rome, and he serves in the Roman church. And serving in the Roman church, he became the parish priest of the church of St. Susanna. This is the 600s. This church is still standing. You can visit it. You can see in the excavations, you can see the ground that St. Sergius, the flooring of the ancient church that St. Sergius would have walked on. And I bring it up because until a few years ago, Pope Francis changed it for I don't know what reason. But up until recently, for, for generations, for ge generations, this church of St. Susanna was the American church in Rome. All the different nationalities have churches, so that if you're a pilgrim in Rome 
And you can go, you can find your own countrymen, you can find the sermons being in the language that you understand. And so you have all of these, these churches, basically national churches. And St. Susanna's church was for the Americans until, like I said, just a few years ago, which is quite extraordinary to see the connection for you Maronites sitting here and our new Maronites and our older historical Maronites that that connection of the American church was to St. Sergius when he was the parish priest of St. Susanna's in Rome. So it's another connection. Lives of the saints are fascinating, are they not? And so St. Sergius eventually becomes Pope. He becomes the Bishop of Rome. From Susanna as parish priest, he becomes the Bishop of Rome. He becomes the Pope. And he has to deal with this great conflict because Byzantium, of course, She's still, I mean, the Muslims are surging in. They've been decimated by the plague. But they still govern. They are still the force in the Mediterranean. It's still the Roman Empire. And the Church of Constantinople decided everyone should be like us. You know, Rome, 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 Rome has history. But Rome, Rome is now 600s. Rome, you know, for 300 years is no longer the capital. So Rome doesn't have all the power. All the power and the glory and the million people are living in Constantinople. They're not living in Rome. And so Constantinople decides, well, everyone needs to do it the way we do it. And they have this whole council. And they condemn as being heretical things like demanding the priests and the deacons to be celibate. You should be able to ordain married men. And that's the norm. You can't prohibit it. That you can't fast you're fasting on Saturdays during Lent, and that is prohibited, and they're condemning that. And they are condemning a number of things, but the one that you may find the most delightful is Constantinople in 692 at this council said you cannot worship the, the Christ under the image of the Lamb of God. And you're like, what? Because we don't do it, therefore none of you should do it. All right? So we talk about Latinization in the last centuries of the Latin church kind of imposing itself, uh, at least being accused of saying, I wouldn't say that it actually did, but accusing it of doing so. Constantinople was doing the same thing in the 600s. And Sergius opposes this whole council. This is unacceptable. These, he defends all of the traditions of the Roman church to the point where he actually has restored the mosaic of the Lamb of God that's in the atrium of the old church of St. Peter's. Not the one that's standing there now, of course, but the older one that Constantine had had built. And he has the icon restored in full value in reaction to this council, which he condemns totally and will not accept their decrees. He is the Pope who added to the Roman liturgy the Agnus Dei. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. The Syrian Roman Pope added the Agnus Dei in reaction to the council of, it's known as Quinisext, of 692. He had been Pope for five years at that point. And he added the Agnus Dei during the fraction of the bread. What it was originally done is the Agnus Dei was at a point when the, the breads, the consecrated breads were broken up into smaller pieces to be distributed as communion. That's when you sang them over and over again. And then in this reaction, the emperor Justinian II was furious. And so he wanted the Pope arrested and brought to Constantinople to answer for this complete insubordination. So I give you these stories. Well, it's actually quite glorious because he orders the governor in Italy, the exarch known as the exarch, to arrest the Pope. And the soldiers themselves, these at this point becoming Germanic soldiers working, Ost Ostrogoths working for the empire living in Italy. They're in Italy, they're Italians if you want now. This whole idea, they actually will not fulfill this command of the empire. They are not going to arrest the Pope. And so he's left empty handed. Because his predecessor that had gone to Constantinople a few centuries beforehand had been St. Martin, martyred. He was sent off into exile. Excuse me, St. Clement. 
Uh, St. Clement, St. Martin, yeah, St. Martin was after St. Clement, we'll get this straight. 2,000 years is hard to keep in your head. So St. Clement would have been the one, St. Martin was the last one who had gone and been arrested anyway. So this is St. Sergius, a Syrian. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up to you is because we have a lot of beautiful traditions amongst all of us, our families, our cultures, our histories, our ethnicities, and they are glorious. But going back to that original question, how does the Christianity see the world? Does she see it broken up by races? Absolutely not. Different cultures? Well, obviously there's different cultures. They speak different languages, they eat different food, they do different things. Some cultures are more refined and more elevated than others, that's fine, but they're all human beings. On the natural level, they are all the, they are all the children of Adam. They are all sons and daughters of Adam. And from that point of view, at the level of nature, we are all brothers and sisters. That's clear. But that's purely nature. And you must never confuse that with the purpose of the plan of salvation, which the unity is those who are engrafted into the Christ. This reading today, there is neither male nor female, nor Greek nor Scythian, nor freeman nor slave. All are made one in the Christ. That is the new human race. That unity is meant to be an elevation because at the level of nature, in which we are all just simply come screaming into the world from our mother's wombs, that is fine. But it is purely nature and it is naturalism. And that naturalism will not bring life because that nature is wounded by original sin. We limp through this world according to nature. And that becomes more clear as we get older, does it not? Nature is not salvific. Nature does not bring salvation. We can't, it's one of the reasons why I have a problem with the pro-life movement referring to the sacredness of human life. It is not sacred in itself. It is nature, it is glorious, it is beautiful, it is the image of God. All that is true. But sacred is when you are baptized, when you enter the kingdom of God that our Lord talks about in the gospel today. That by the baptism, the faith to be able to see the kingdom and the baptism of water and the spirit, which allows us to be born again into a new nature, into enter into the kingdom. Which is why our Lord says, unless a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the beauty of this whole life of Saint Sergius is a reminder to us. We are not redeemed because we have Irish grandparents. We are not redeemed because we have an Italian ancestors. We are not redeemed because we have Syrian Maronite ancestors. Those are beautiful stories, but they do not bring the grace of redemption in themselves. They are purely questions of culture and of nature. And St. Sergius is a perfect example, a man who all ethnicity, if you want to talk about it, is a Syrian, born to an Eastern tradition of Antioch, more similar to St. John Maron, his contemporary with the establishment of the Maronite church really officially then in 685. He becomes Pope Sergius in 687, two years later. The church that you sit in is directly related to this period of history. And so the beauty of it is, is that that's why you have been welcomed, both our historic and our new Maronites. The house of Maron, Beit Maroon, is one reality to bring transcendent grace and the Catholic faith to all, including all of our Celtic and Franco compatriots in Maine to bring this religion, which is why Sergius defended the traditions of the Roman church against the usurpations of Constantinople. It didn't matter what his ethnicity was. Ethnically doesn't matter anything. We are all the children of Adam. But how we are united within the body of Christ, that is the source of salvation. That is the healing of the human race. And so on this day in which we commemorate this great Pope, I mean, he intercede for us and obtain for us truly a supernatural vision and not to degenerate into naturalism. The vision of everyone being brothers and sisters, one father and all being brothers, that is masonry and pure naturalism. That is not the vision 
of Christianity. The vision of Christianity is we are brought together into brothers and sisters in the one household of God to see the face of the hidden Father and not some mat- merely natural unity. This is why masonry and Catholicism have been in death throes for the last 300 years. Because you're either going to base the unity of the human race purely upon nature, or you're going to base it upon the unification redemptively within the Christ. There is no third. There is no other possibility. And this is a fight to the death, which is why Sergius said he would rather be imprisoned than to accede to that imposition of Constantinople. So may Saint Sergius intercede for us before God, obtain for us a profoundly supernatural faith, inflamed by charity and profoundly anchored in conviction in the virtue of hope, to see all things in a supernatural light of the salvation of the Christ. And may his prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Sergius. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Alleluia. for St. John Marin on page 897. 897. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Good and holy God and Father, through your only Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have prepared this spiritual and holy banquet for us. Accept these pure offerings and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to approach your sanctuary with pure hearts and clear consciences. Grant us the peace that your only Son gave to his holy disciples, so that we may give one another that same peace with a holy kiss. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith.
O Lord, may your peace and security and your love, grace, and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, we bow before you and ask that your merciful right hand rest upon your servants who are here before your majesty. Mark us with a sign of life, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Father of mercies, Lord of creation, Lord of the universe, unsearchable God, you are the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, born of you and equal to you. He is the radiance of your glory, the image of your being, and by your power the maker of all. In him you created the world in your grace. In him we see you, and from him we receive your spirit. In him the mystery of the Trinity, hidden from all ages, was revealed. We praise and thank you with our mouths that have been blessed by your word and cleansed with your forgiving his soul. Those who glorify you are countless, cherubim and seraphim and thousands of spiritual beings standing before you and myriads of fiery ranks serving your majesty. They sing triumphant hymns with harmonious voices. O oh Lord, although we are your weak and sinful children, make us worthy through the gift of your grace to sing with them and to proclaim. Glory to you, God the Father. We have exalted our human nature through your grace. In your abundant mercy, we sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came down to us. In all things for our salvation. Sagi, et a shadow, meti, hem. 
حسین حامی و حایران قلم علمی آمین Do this in memory of me For whenever you gather in my name And eat this bread and drink this cup You remember my death and resurrection Until I come again Now remember all that you suffered and endured for us and your liberating and life-giving plan of salvation, your miraculous incarnation, your saving passion, your life-giving cross, and your life-giving death, your solemn burial, your joyous resurrection, your ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of the Father, and your second coming when you shall reward all people according to their deeds. O Lord, have compassion and pour out your mercy upon all of us, that we may enjoy the gifts of your heavenly church. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. find comfort in those who repent be humbled may the prophets be remembered the apostles honored and all the martyrs crowned and may the confessors exalt and all the angels rejoice may your divinity be praised and your trinity be honored father son and holy spirit now and always and forever We offer you, O Lord, this sacrifice, the memorial of your passion, crucifixion, death, and resurrection for your church throughout the world. She is founded upon your hope, remembers your salvation, and awaits your kingdom. We offer it for the bishops of the true faith. Grant them the wisdom and knowledge that comes from you and make them worthy to proclaim your kingdom, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, 
Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. May all the shepherds of the Church sanctify their days by caring, in fear and in justice, for your people that you have entrusted to them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the priests and deacons here and everywhere who serve diligently and are vigilant over their flocks. May they receive their reward. Remember those who have taken vows of chastity and holiness, who keep their bodies and thoughts pure, that they may triumph in their efforts. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders who love you and all those whom you wish to govern us. Strengthen and assist them so that we may live in peace under their leadership. Crown them with true faith and good works. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the children of the Church, redeemed by your passion and given life by your death, for they share in your resurrection, those who are far and those who are near, those who are weak and those who are strong. Remember those who have presented these offerings upon your holy altar and accept them on your heavenly altar. Hear their just requests, and in exchange for their earthly gifts, grant them the gifts of heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those whom we have remembered and those whom we have not. In your mercy, have compassion on them. Remember especially those in distress who experience hardships, the poor, the weak, and the grieving, those in exile, captives and prisoners, the oppressed, outcasts, and the dejected, orphans and widows. Remember those bound by the chains of sin and subjected to various passions, through your body and blood, may their sins be forgiven, their faults be pardoned, their weaknesses be cured, and their wounds be healed. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your great mercy, our fathers and patriarchs, the teachers of your holy church, who were pleasing to you from the beginning. By the glorious light of their teachings, they brought people back from the darkness of ignorance to the true light of the Holy Gospel, and they fought to preserve the integrity of the true faith. Through their holy prayers, grant peace to your churches, monasteries, and convents, and put an end to wars and strife throughout the world. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all your saints, especially Mary, the holy and ever-virgin Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, and all who profess the Trinity in the true faith, through their holy prayers and petitions, look upon us with eyes of compassion, and may your calming and pleasant face shine upon us. Make us worthy to share in their reward and in their inheritance, and may their shadow be a shelter of protection for us on the fearful day of judgment. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, in the sweetness of your compassion, receive the souls of our brothers and sisters, the children of baptism, who have gone to you into the true faith from this world of darkness, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered. May the mystery of your body and blood be a pledge of life for them, a fire that consumes all sins and a burning coal that destroys transgressions. In your mercy grant them rest in the dwellings of light and joy in the heavenly Jerusalem. O lover of all people, grant us life, abundant blessings and mercy, and forgive our sins and theirs. Do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. 
Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in all sun in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. us by your holy gifts. May you dwell among us that we may be secure. May your peace live within our hearts, your faith abide in our consciences, and your cross be a true sign of protection for your church. May our tongues proclaim your truth and repeat your holy prayer, and our lips pour forth glorious thanks to you that with you we may dare to call the Father Abba, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are thine, now and forever. O Lord, do not lead us, your lowly children, into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Kulukun. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, we have approached your holy altar, the source of divine gifts. May we share in your holy mysteries and join the assembly of those who glorify you, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, 
and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Thank you, O Lord, we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Go in and get a, a glass dish that we can fill with water.
this. It's filled with water. You have to fill this back up. And put this in the lock this in the cabinet. Don't switch the plate. Just lock it back in the cabinet. We thank you, O God, Father of great mercy, and we praise and glorify you for having made us worthy of your holy banquet and of sharing in your life-giving mysteries. We implore you, do not condemn us on that fearful day, but deliver us from all shame and disgrace, that we may join the assembly of your saints, so that with them and among them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo Elokolokun. O Christ, the King of glory, we entrust our lives to you, knowing that you will take care of our needs. Help the elderly with your mighty power. Restrain the young with your guidance. Nurture children and instruct them in your divine teaching and sign each one of us with your victorious cross. To you be glory with your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved, and bro beloved brothers and sisters 
with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.